What is up everybody? Thank you for stopping in. So in this video, we're going to be discussing the backstory of Kyle Davies and Suzu. It's super interesting. And the reason we have this information is because Arthur Hayes put out a blog post on his medium uh, discussing this because he actually knew Suzu and Kyle Davies before they started 3AC. They actually worked together. He knew them personally. So really interesting to kind of hear it from him. And for those of you who don't know, Arthur Hayes is someone I've talked about on this channel before as a Twitter account you must follow. He is the ex-CEO of BitMEX. Um, he is a crypto native. He has been in here for a long time, the space that is, and is super knowledgeable. He used to be a, a big time trader, I think over, it might have been Deutsche. I can't remember what bank specifically he was at. Um, it, it says it actually in this article, so we might go over it there. But uh, again, big time trader, super advanced. So a lot of what he puts out in these blog posts are like over my head. So I'm not going to talk about the things that I don't understand. What I'm going to kind of read off to you guys and go into detail on is the backstory of 3AC because again I think it's super interesting um, and if you don't already you should definitely note when these articles come out because they give amazing insight into what a pro level trader is seeing in the space what their thoughts are on the space um, so again some of it's advanced some of it you might not understand but it's definitely worth reading um, now they also are very long so make sure that you cut out some time to read it when you do um, or you might have to stop and pick back up on it later so we're going to go ahead get started in this blog post and i'm going to read where the 3ac situation sort of starts the collapse of 3ac in and of itself is unremarkable a hedge fund that was previously successful executing boring but stable yielding arbitrage strategies decided to strap on leverage to accelerate returns and paid the price. The use of borrowed funds to, pay, to play the Terra USD carry trade sealed their death sentence. So what is he saying here? Well, 3AC used to be just an arbitrage shop. So they would take little risk and just play some arbitrage opportunities, which for those of you who don't know what an arbitrage is, is when one market uh, is pricing a, an item or a commodity or a token or whatever it is different than another market so in that case what you can do is buy from one sell on the other and pocket the difference okay um, so that is kind of where 3ac got its start that's what they did um, and what he's saying is they decided to strap on leverage um, in order to accelerate those returns but what made the 3ac default so impactful is that it blew a whale shark-sized hole in many of the largest centralized crypto lending businesses. Due to loss on 3AC loans, many of these lending businesses have gated customer funds and became functionally insolvent. The withdrawal of credit from the crypto ecosystem has caused a generation or a generalized market crash of Bitcoin, Ether, and the whole pantheon of shitcoins. No coin has been spared. So we've covered this in lots of the other videos that I've done on this channel, basically how 3AC going under has pulled all of the centralized lending institutions that gave them loans under as well, mainly because those centralized lending institutions were not following any good risk parameters um, and were taking on way too much exposure to 3AC. <clears throat> But what's conveniently going unmentioned by much of the media is that both centralized and decentralized lending companies platforms had exposure to 3AC, and only the players in one of the two markets went belly up. The centralized lenders failed in mass, while their decentralized counterparts liquidated collateral and operated with no hiccups. Using the story of 3AC as the canvas, let me paint you a picture that illustrates why Lord Satoshi and Archangel Vitalik's creations stood the test of time and what makes this, uh, what this means for the future of crypto. So again, that's something else that I've said in my previous videos is that the centralized lending institutions went under while decentralized ones like Aave have just continued running with basically nothing <laughs> bad happening at all. And the reason for that is because they have to post collateral to Aave. So they can't just take out a loan that is just, you know, an unsecured loan. They have to post collateral that Aave could then sell to replenish the loan that they gave 3AC in the event of a liquidation. So Hong Kong, before we get into it, uh, too deep into it, though, let's first take a quick scroll down memory lane to better understand how 3AC principals Suzu and Kyle Davies ascended to greatness. 
Sue and Kyle graduated university in 2008, the same year as myself, and at some subsequent point made their way to Asia Pacific as employees of TradFi banks slash market makers. The Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo investment banking scene is very close-knit. While I didn't know either Sue or Kyle directly until many years later when we all entered to crypto, we ran in adjacent circles of friends and were at most uh, at one most one degree separated at that time. Uh, the first time I met Kyle at a tempura restaurant in Singapore, I could have sworn I had seen him before at a party in Hong Kong. I never did any business with Kyle, who worked for a time at Credit Suisse, but I did trade against Sue while he was market a market maker at Flow Traders. As the head market maker for the APAC Exchange Traded Fund ETF business at Deutsche Bank, I posted buy slash sell quotes on the Hong Kong and Singapore stock exchange for a large ETF product suite. Okay, so what he's saying now is Kyle was at Credit Suisse, um, Sue was at Flow Traders, and Arthur Hayes was at Deutsche. And uh, as you were saying in the article, there it's a very close knit community over there in the Asia Pacific markets. Um, so they were, you know, not working at the same places, but ran in the same circles. Routinely made errors and got served many ass whoopings at the hands of flow traders. No excuses. I just regularly lost money to them. Sue was one of the flow traders professionals who kept me on my toes on a daily basis. Sue followed up his time at flow traders with a stint at Deutsche and worked on an adjacent trading jet desk to Killa, who I talked about in previous essay. In a previous essay. The point of this story is that Sue and Kyle are arbitrage guys. In their banking careers, they were just trained to profit off of small discrepancies in price. Do it over and over again, and the money adds up. They brought this same approach and mentality to their founding of Three Arrows, which got its start by ar- arbitraging the very inefficient, over-the-counter, non-deliverable forward market, NDF market. Now, moving on to my time at Citibank. While I was the head of ETF trader at Citibank, I also dabbled in equity index forward trading, including NDFs. Our desk traded equity index forwards on the major Hong Kong, Taiwanese, Indian, and Korean indices. I also ran the entire China A-share ETF trading book and traded a large amount of equity-linked derivatives. An NDF is a currency bet. We're going to skip that piece. Um, it talks about wands and how that whole thing works. Just get it in your head that uh, Suzu and Cal Davies were arbitrage traders. And typically arbitrage traders, those types of trades are very low risk um, and fairly easy to execute. Not easy to execute trades, but you're just playing off of the mispricing of a market. Okay, So again, if one market is priced higher than another, you buy in the cheap one, sell in the expensive one until that trade goes away. Eventually, the, the prices will even back out. Um, so that is how Suzu and Cal Davies sort of got their start. Um, that's what they were sort of trained to do when they were in the banking world. As bankers, Suzu and Kyle saw this inefficient market and used their own money to start a fund with a trading strategy centered around profiting on these mispricings. It's worth noting that unless you are a trader at a bank or extremely large hedge fund, it is almost impossible to trade in the NDF market. You must have an ISDA, and the senior management of the bank you are trading with must allow you to trade with them. But somehow, someway, 3AC managed to open accounts at a few investment banks and arbitrage them against each other in the Asian NDF market. When Sue and Kyle told me how they got started, I was pretty impressed that they had hustled their way into this lucrative market. So what's important here is that it, this kind of outlines that Kyle and Sue had big connections in the space, and that's sort of rolling out now. We're kind of seeing how enrooted 3AC was, and I think a lot of that played into the clout that they had as well and why people were so willing to give them loans uh, without checking their financials first is because of all the clout they had, the people they knew, they were in the in circle. Um, so I think that, again, this is sort of how, th- this is important because it out- outlines the relationships that they had, the kind of relationships that they had. This is how 3AC made money for years. Then at some point, the firm discovered crypto and, and uh, applied their trade as cash and carry basis traders. This is a bread and but- the bread and butter of many crypto ARB fund, of any crypto ARB fund, the perpetual swap over its history has net paid shorts, which means if you sell USD, buy Bitcoin, then sell Bitcoin USD perp, 
you will earn net funding over time. So this is trade, again, very low risk because what happens is, is basically they're in a neutral position. They bought a bunch of Bitcoin and then they sold the same amount of Bitcoin short. So they're just capturing uh, the funding rate on that short Bitcoin, which is usually like, you know, a fraction of a percent. It might be a few basis points, um, but on a lot of money, that's that adds up. So these currency arbitrage and funding trades are very profitable, but they also are capital intensive. You must post margin to trade every NDF derivative, and you will not get credit for having the equal and opposite position at another bank. For the crypto perp funding arb trade, you cannot use any leverage. This means that growth of your hedge funds AUM is slow and predictable, but you won't be staring at big pimping anytime soon. So what he's saying is, is that 3AC's original strategy, the way that they were originally making money, was a surefire way to make money, but wasn't very exciting. You weren't going to make you know, billions unless you had a lot of money to post to do this. Because again, it's sort of like a savings account, right? If you deposit $10 into a we'll even say a hundred dollars into a savings account and they're paying you 0.01 percent that's not a lot of money you're not going to get rich on that in this case it's sort of like the same idea that if you take that money and you're just capturing that very little uh, percentage yeah you'll make a you know a few hundred thousand a year maybe um, but you're not going to be the next massive AUM fund by doing that um, so that's basically what he's saying here from the horse's mouth we have been long crypto for a while davies said we we've not always been long ethereum in fact we've been short for periods of time too what's the best what's the best way to beat bitcoin right now well it's just to own ethereum the ultimate goal of my book is to outperform bitcoin davies said that ethereum is currently in the firm's largest cryptocurrency holding it has gained 245 percent this year compared to the u.s dollar while bitcoin is up 29 percent so after this, he goes in to discuss the Terra Luna situation, which most of us know that situation, how exposed 3AC was. And to them, the whole Terra Luna system basically um, was sort of right up their alley, right? They can post collateral in what is basically a stable coin, capture 20% interest. It seems on paper practically risk-free, right? They're putting money into Anchor. They're getting 20%. This is fantastic. It's a stable coin, yada, yada. We've heard the story over and over again. Um, and obviously, Terra fell apart, which is what caused their downfall and unwound a lot of the risk that 3AC was taking. So we're going to pick back up from the Terra USD uh, collapse. Back to our boys at 3AC. The reason why I rambled on about Hong Kong history earlier is because I want you to understand how these guys initially grew their fund. A carry trade like UST cannot be ignored, particularly for folks like Suzu and Kyle, who have been big proponents of DeFi and who have made lots of money directly betting correctly the growth in price of a number of other protocols. We know that 3AC held a large amount of Luna, but we don't know is how deep they were in UST carry trade. Davies said that 3AC invested over $200 million in Luna tokens as part of the $1 billion raise by the Luna Foundation Guard in February. At an amount that is now essentially worthless since Terra ecosystem imploded in mid-May. The Terra Luna situation caught us very much off guard, says Davies to the Wall Street Journal. We've covered that as well. The USD carry trade was very simple. In this part, he breaks down that trade. Um, I'm not going to go through it again. A lot of it's pretty advanced. Um, it's just the ways that they were moving around money uh, within Luna to, to make extra yield. Again, we know the ending of that story. Using your own capital as a hedge fund severely limits the profit potential. A real master of the universe when presented with such a juicy carry trade levers up by borrowing money, which is what they did. They started leveraging up. We saw that time and time again. So it sounds like it sounds like Three Arrows Capital was playing pretty their cards pretty close to the chest. They they, you know, were sticking with what they knew, they were doing good, and then all of a sudden Luna came around and it was sort of their kryptonite. So they saw this opportunity with UST. So what do they do? They start leveraging the Ethereum and every every other token that they had um, to buy more UST to deposit and earn more interest in um, the Anchor Protocol. So they did this over and over again, and that's what got them into this leverage mess. Now, what's so interesting to me about that is that you feel like guys like Kyle Davies and Suzu would know that 
first of all, algo stables have yet to work. We have yet to find one that works. And the idea that a protocol could sustain 20% inflation in a bear market is just unreal to me. So um, basically, that's that's what they did. They kind of took the, the Terra Luna pill um, and started leverage trading up. And uh, again, we know most of that story. And this pretty much ends the backstory of 3AC. But I thought it was super interesting to hear from Arthur Hayes, someone who knows them personally, you know, the backstory of 3AC, what their bread and butter was that First of all, they weren't massive risk takers. Their trading strategy was always pretty basic. It was just arbitrage. Um, and it, they had been doing that for a while in crypto. And clearly, it was working before Terra, Luna. Um, and then once the whole Luna situation came about, it was just like greed, you know, totally covered their eyes. And they just went all out on Luna. They started leveraging everything they had. Um, all the ETH that they had, they leveraged up on so that they could buy more UST, plug it into Anchor. Um, and obviously, we know the story there. It blew up and took Three Arrows Capital under with them. So thought I'd break that down for you guys. I'm going to include the link to this article down below. You guys should definitely read the whole thing if you're interested in this story or just crypto in general. Um, it's really, really worth the read. All of Arthur Hayes' posts, even the old ones, I think are worth reading because it helps you kind of take on the mindset um, and just kind of see how traders are looking at this market, ones who have been in crypto for a very long time. So uh, guys, if this is your first time to the channel, please like and subscribe. With that being said, I will catch you next time.